that light is really bright. Just don't look over there. Oh, okay. Well, let's go ahead and get uh, started. I just have a few announcements. Um, we're still selling t-shirts and we have most sizes still available. Um, all t-shirts are sort of donations that go towards uh, EFF or HFC. And uh, we are also have a few bags and items available, available from previous years. So you can uh, stop by and see if you're interested in getting some of the swag from some of the previous or past years. Also, uh, Python for Newbies, 11.1 uh, in Columbia Foyer or in the Chill Out area. And uh, we're also looking for feedback on the con. Uh, you can send all feedback uh, to feedback at shmoocon.org uh, or you can, or we also have info at shmoocon.org. Um, also, it turns out that uh, all the stuff from Uganda has arrived for the HFC booth, uh, so you should stop by. And Ted is also, if you've missed any of the talks, uh, Ted is selling DVDs back in the vendor area. Um, I also have a few giveaways. If anybody would like a moose. moose. Wow. I have this uh, Control-Alt-Hack. I'm not going to throw this one, so the first person that makes it up here. <laughs> Uh, I got a t-shirt. <laughs> oh, see, that's why I never throw that way. Then I got one last bag. Yeah! Oh, okay. There you go. Oh. Sort of a floater. Uh, then I'm going to go ahead and turn uh, the rest of the time over to uh, David Pisano for the identity-based uh, network protocol. Good morning. All right. I wish it wasn't. Um, my name is David Pisano. I'm a uh, senior network engineer at the Mitre Corporation. I'm also a contributor to the HoneyNet project. Uh, I also, and I've been doing the data viz here at uh, in Shmoocom Labs for the past few years. Today I'm going to talk to you about uh, Identity-Based Internet Protocol, or IBIP for short. Uh, I'm going to go over sort of the problems and motivations behind, well, the problems that sort of inspired us to actually create this and, the, um, and go over some of the concepts of IBIP and then we'll cover some of the transformational security claims that we're making on it and then some, we're going to, we're going to talk about the, how we went about testing some of those concepts. Uh, to sort of back up our claims because I can sit here and claim all I want. If I don't have proof, it doesn't mean anything. <laughs> all right, a um, few things before I start. Uh, IBIP is still under development. Uh, there's some aspects of this will, that will likely change. And uh, one thing I want to emphasize right at the start is that IBIP is for enterprise network. It is networks. It is not for the Internet. <laughs> and that will make sense later on. <laughs> All right, uh, with the current state of malware, it, uh, it is impossible to prevent, prevent it from en entering your network. Uh, there are numerous unknown vulnerabilities in the, so in the software you use, uh, the, the current state of browser plugins, and with drive-by attacks, um, browsers are being compromised on a very regular basis. Uh, users will almost always be, uh, always always be susceptible to social engineering and have their credentials uh, stolen. And they'll always click on links in their emails, <laughs> at least most of them. Um, given the sophistication of current malware, host-based malware detection is a losing proposition. Um, one of the first things that some pieces of malware do is disable the, the uh, malware detection. Uh, and sort of give you an idea of the scale of the problem, uh, there's something in the order of uh, 200,000 uh, pieces of new malware detected each day. So what is IBIP? IBIP is a new network architecture uh, that leverages existing equipment. Uh, we only need to have one appliance per layer three segment 
This device enforces all behavioral and access control policies outside of the host. Uh, its key features are adding user and host identity into each IP packet uh, while preventing spoofing. We add dynamic role and trust metrics uh, that are used as a gating function for access control. Uh, policies can be changed on the fly uh, to adapt to changes in threat conditions of the network. Uh, clients are hidden and network infrastructure is made in inaccessible. Uh, any attempt to access these uh, generates an alert. And of course, network infrastructure is accessible to authorized users, so your network admins can get to it, um, but they can only get to it. You can lock it down so they can only get to it from certain systems uh, or require additional access credentials to get to it. Um, the major benefits to IBIP are that it combines user and host identity at the packet level, uh, allows for the network to uh, adapt to changes in threat conditions and creates an, a, creates and enforces a permissible use policy for network applications. And, uh, and how trustworthy a um, user and host is. All of this gives the operator of the network an unprecedented uh, situational understanding uh, and the potential for a truly self-defending network. Uh, one of the objectives of IBIP was actually to test uh, the recommendations set forth in a, uh, in, a, in a DARPA study back in 2010. So I'm going to go over the uh, sort of the concepts and the, arch the architectural concepts involved in operating um, the network. So IBIP makes IBIP con architectural concepts involve making uh, operational distinguish uh, distinguishing between clients, servers, and infrastructure device and between IBIP endpoints uh, either within the local enclaves or within your network or on remote networks or remote enclaves and, and those that sit outside of IBIP, um, which are reachable via the uh, trust gateway. Um, IBIP policies are enforced at each um, edge point of the network uh, using COTS switches, routers, and a MITRE developed um, IBIP policy enforcement point or uh, PEP. Um, and this MITRE PEP serves as the main enforcement point, um, which uh, we refer to this uh, concept, we refer to sort of this edge area sort of as the, uh, the switch PEP router as IBIP edge string. Um, essentially, each user user switch in an IPIP enclave is um, backed by an IPIP PEP. So now the items in green here are um, are MITRE developed s systems. Um, so we build it using using COTS components. Um, we develop the IPIP proxy. Through that. Here and um, or the PEP there, and as mentioned earlier, we have uh, the PEP which mentioned earlier. Then we have the registration server, um, network operations, and the trust gateway, which is down here. The trust gateway is still under development. The effects of the IPIP architecture is that uh, access to the network is based on user's identity and that of its machine, of their machine. Um, IPIP address, or IP addresses are tied to the identity and the, the switches are configured so that each switch port uh, is restricted to the host and user uh, that is off, um, that authenticates effectively eliminating the ability to spoof IP addresses. Um, private VLANs are leveraged to maintain separation between hosts on the same subnet. Uh, the components that uh, incorporate, or uh, the combination of incorporating identity into the IP packet and preventing spoofing um, provides accountability 
of the traffic in a way that is simply not possible today. As mentioned previously, clients are hidden in the network and what a client is permitted to access on the network is determined by the user's role and organization. Um, similarly, servers are constrained by policy to provide only those services that are authorized. If policies are violated, uh, an alert is generated and informs the network operator. Um, depending on the current threat condition, these violations can result in the um, out-of-policy actions being permitted. So um, these policies can either be that just an alert is generated um, if the network is sort of under a permissible state, permissive state, or if <coughs> Threat conditions are higher, um, that the packets will actually be dropped and so the alerts will happen. Um, the result is a network that is tailored to the business needs and those uh, using it. Um, with this uh, significantly reduces the threat surface and much improves the network situational awareness. So let me go over how a user gets on the network and what happens in the back end. Um, when a uh, user slash host uh, connects to the network, they need to get authenticated. Um, we are leveraging 802.1x on the edge switch to, comp to accomplish this. Uh, <coughs> the edge switch communicates with the registration server that is running a uh, radius service. The 802.1x supplicant on the, on the host will first send um, some form of hardware certificate. Uh, this creates a encrypted tunnel. A certificate from some sort of um, smart card is then sent. And this acts as the user's identity or the user's certificate. Uh, if a user is successful in authenticating, this, um, this process will bind the physical port on the switch to the MAC address of the system. Um, the registration server then auto-configures the PEP to bind the, IP to the MAC to the IP address. Um, if the host is a server, uh, TCP UDP source port usage policies can be pushed to only allow authorized services. Um, by requiring strong authentication to get onto the network, um, we are able to get accountability via packet level ID that is traceable back to the user and host credentials. Through the uh, MAC to port bindings and the MAC to IP bindings, um, we're able to reduce the likelihood of spoofing or impersonation. Uh, with the registration server, pushing uh, source port restrictions. It enables creation and enforcement of policies with a low false alarm rate. Um, also, uh, all of this significantly uh, improves situational awareness. What's the mechanism for the source port restriction? Do you need standard radius? Is there something um, <clears throat> we've, we don't do it through radius. Um, we push, we push policies to the um, policy enforcement points or the PEPs um, via, it's, a, out of, it's not through, a, we, um, we push it through an SSH tunnel, the PEPs. No, it is on the, it is in the uh, policy enforcement points, uh, which acts as, they act as, a, as a, like a layer two, um, they act at layer two, so they're almost like a layer two firewall. Mm -hmm. By the way, the question was, um, just repeat it. <laughs> oh, the it was the mechanism for the short source port restrictions. All right, here's an example of how uh, permissible use policy for the network uh, policies works and the effects that violations have. Um, here we have a, a web server that is approved to run services on port, uh, TCP ports 80 and 443. Uh, any outbound packets from these ports are allowed through um, pulse enforcement point. 
Um, if there is a packet from a port that is not approved, uh, like port 23, uh, it will generate a policy violation. This is then sent to the NetApps console um, with the source attribution information. Correct, TCP or UDP source port. Correct. Uh, if the number of policy violations exceed or exceed a set threshold for either the user or host, uh, trust metrics are updated and sent to the registration server. Uh, the registration server tells the PEP to update the trust metric uh, labels on the server source, uh, source shim, um, on the ink ingress to the network. Um, you have the option of having uh, a trouble ticket automatically generated. The, so when I update the trust metric, um, the effect is that you can, uh, the system will System be let, you can presume the system would be less trusted, um, and that have it, can have an effect on what it can access. Um, so are you reconfiguring It's more like me trying to figure out the right words to, that I can actually say. <laughs> um, there's some access of this, some aspects of this stuff that hasn't been cleared for public release yet. So, um, there are predefined buckets, at least from my understanding. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Does that imply that your does the change in bucket imply a change in monitoring or an actual restriction in uh, what is accessible? And accessible? It has the potential of, of restricting what that system can access. So, given that you would want to use this in an actual uh, uh, production environment, right. Then that's why there's also that automatic trouble, trouble ticket generation. So there's, you, the user sets what, what happens at what trust levels. And so you can have, um, I think in the yeah, next slide, slide, I actually go over the shims and how much um, information there is in the trust level. So let me go over that. And if that still doesn't quite answer your question, I can try to address it. Uh, uh, so this is how the shim is laid out in, the, in, in our IPv4 implementation. Uh, the shim is added uh, remotely by the PEP. Uh, it is inserted between layer 3 and layer 4. Um, the shim contains attribution information for the source and destination and uh, optionally the current role and trust level of the system. Um, we can support somewhere in the order of about a trillion IDs for both user and host ID, about 32,000 organizations, uh, 212 roles, and we have a dynamic trust levels. Uh, we can have eight dynamic trust levels. Uh, I'm going to ex now explain how the shim and access control is, uh, is handled. Uh, once the user is authenticated, um, policies are, are pushed to the PEP um, for any of them. Uh, the PEP adds the outbound packet, ingress filtering, and policy. Um, sorry. Shim is added. Um, PEP adds the shims. 
um, and it gets filtered through outbound, uh, as it ships to outbound packets. Uh, ingress filtering and policies are applied uh, to the packet, and then the packet is forwarded on across the network. Uh, the receiving PEP uh, applies egress filtering policies and removes the shim from the packet. All right, I'm not going to go over some of our um, claims, our security claims on this and the benefits that IPEP has. Um, here's a list of threats and vulnerabilities that sort of everyone operating the network uh, faces. So just basic insider threats, malware. Um, anonymous, oper anonymous operation supply chain and some supply chain compromise and of course you get vulnerabilities in your software, zero day exploit, um, slow, slow time for users, uh, slow response time for users to um, patch or even internal processes to patch your, your servers, uh, weak passwords, and social engineering. Um, if the intruder only, op if the computer operates within the, pr the principal use policy of that user and host, none. <laughs> No. So we, we haven't really. Yes. Yes. Yeah. The, the the trust stuff is still in active development. <laughs> Yeah. Um, all right. So IBIP, uh, IBIP allows. Sorry. IBIP allows policies to say sort of what is permitted and by whom. Um, it provides attribution and accountability um, at the network label uh, layer. Uh, the attribution is down to the user and host. Uh, by, may, by, making in, by making identity spoofing difficult and failed attempts visible, um, this increases the confidence in the information, in this information. Uh, by making clients and infrastructures inaccessible, uh, this reduces the threat surface of the network. Um, IBIP establishes um, policy monitoring and enforcement external to the host. Um, uh, this is to prevent um, so this is very useful for the fact that if a system is overrun by malicious by malicious exploit that overrunning this the system doesn't overrun the network protection um, IBUP establishes a mechanism to dynamically address roles and privileges of users and hosts in response to um, changing threats. Uh, IBIP, it supports a concept of excuse me, uh, dynamic trust metrics. Uh, this can be leveraged as an additional discrimi uh, discriminator in determining whether access to a highly, um, highly sensitive material should be granted to a particular user and host under different threat conditions. Um, permits significant, significant enhancement to situational understanding both in real time and historically. Uh, this enables the ability for, to do a search of, for under the radar activity, um, but will have the uh, information, 
have all the information to, to attribute um, back to the host and user identity in the packet. And you know, so this now you don't have to go back and dig through log files to figure out which system um, logged in, which system had that particular IP address in DHCP and which user was logged in in the Active Directory logs. So I've made some pretty big claims here, and so I'm not going to sort of cover um, how I'm now sort of hopefully back them up. Um, so to test the com this concept, concept yeah. uh, to test this, uh, we had a penetration t testing team come in. Um, prior to them coming in, they were fully briefed on how IBEP operated. Uh, we set up five objectives that they needed to accomplish. Uh, these, were these, uh, these were to um, gain access to the network, conduct network reconnaissance, sp spoof another IP, IP address, gain, gain access to a server uh, leveraging um, a zero-day exploit or a pre-placed backdoor, uh, and try to gain access to a client from a server. The uh, blue team's role in all of this was purely passive. Uh, they were not allowed to take any actions on what they saw. Um, if the pen test team couldn't uh, accomplish a particular objective, they were given additional information to allow them to move on to the next. Mm -hmm. A week. So the, the test lasted for a week. Um, now we had four policies in place during this test. Um, the policies were that all clients were hidden. Uh, infrastructure was inaccessible. Uh, each server had a permissible use policy. And there was one, one policy per server. And a minimal trust metric for ingress and egress was established. So the first objective was for the Pinterest team to try to gain access to the network. Uh, we gave them access to a port and switch, uh, the MAC address of a valid system that was allowed on the network. Uh, they tried using a hub so that they could insert themselves between the uh, switch and authorized system. Um, they then tried connecting uh, with a unregistered, um, stolen, or counterfeit user uh, credentials. Uh, they were unsuccessful in achieving this objective or any of the sub-objectives. Uh, at this point, we provided the team with a uh, valid credential that had uh, full access to the network. Uh, they were also given, we also gave them a list of all the IPs and MAC addresses being used along with a network topology. Uh, their objective was to verify IP addresses of client machines and any infrastructure devices. Um, they were also asked to see if they could uh, eavesdrop, in, eavesdrop on any potential active traffic between clients and servers on that switch. Um, they were again unsuccessful in all their attempts. Uh, the next objective for the pen testing team was to uh, try to spoof a IP address of a other another system in the network. Um, they first tried to send an IP, uh, send a packet with a fake source IP. Uh, next, they were provided with the MAC and IP address of a valid system that was in use. Um, they also tried. They also tried that with a. Um, hub between that system uh, and the switch and tried to impersonate the system. Uh, and again, they were unsuccessful. Um, objective four, they were asked to try to leverage a, um, a zero day vulnerability on one of the servers from a compromised client. Uh, the target server was registered as a web server with ports 80 and 443 permitted. El Telnet server was running on port 23 and acting as a uh, simulated zero day. The pen test team was provided with uh, full access to an authorized client and the username and password needed to log in via Telnet. Um, 
they were unsuccessful in trying in being able to log in. Uh, the final objective for the pen test team was to repeat the previous objective but from a server and try to attack a client. Uh, the pen test team was allowed to install any software they wanted on their server. Um, they were also unsuccessful in trying to access a client. Um, so after all, going through all five of these objectives, they were unsuccessful in gaining any of them and all their attempts were fully detected um, by the blue team. So in summary, uh, to sort of recap what the benefits of IBIP are to network security is uh, by hiding client systems, we reduce the threat surface by enabling, by enabling users and host identity, by embedding user and host identity into each packet and by preventing spoofing, we enable accountability and traceback account, um, activity. By enabling access control based upon a user and host identity, we enable subcutation and isolation of critical infrastructure. Um, by enabling a permissible use policy for network applications, we are able to get uh, increased situational understanding uh, of what is happening on the network. This is all, um, this is all implemented with a um, the minimal human interaction for infrastructure communication, infrastructure configuration, uh, and this leads to reduced chance of human error and configuration changes. Any questions? Right now, um, anyone who has, so our target audience for this, is anyone who has systems that sort of, like crown jewel systems. So you have, That's yeah I know. <laughs> We're working on scale, um, so right now, the model, that model was a lab. Um, I think 20 users. Hang on. It is inserted between the layer three and layer four header beyond that, I don't know. So the, the, are, are the packets still readable with standard tools or does it screw up parsing? It does screw up parsing. Someone else had a And so the question was, since we're adding things to the packet, are we exceeding the MTU size of the, um, the headers, or of the Ethernet frames, is that correct? Right. Um, what we've done to account for that is we've actually lowered the MTU size for the network, uh, for the client systems, uh, and we do have um, some user, regular users making use of this right now. Um, they're in different organizations, um, but not necessarily, I'm not sure about privilege levels. Hang on. Not, so the question was whether or not we have anything um, in place to handle failover of the trust servers. Um, that is not 
yet happened. <laughs> Rusty's first. <laughs> um, so you were being for being early, but uh, mm. kind of what does this provide that something like Cisco's ICE or any like standard A2X deployment doesn't? So what does this provide um, that Cisco's ICE or A2.1X deployments doesn't? Um, one of the big things this, this provides is that it gives you the attribution in the packet, so you don't have to go back and look at logs or correlate logs. Um, and the auto configuration aspects, at least I've, I've looked at ICE, and it's still, and if it is the same thing I'm thinking of, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, you still have to sort of, you manually punch in access lists. I don't handle that aspect of the development, so I'm not sure. Um, hang on, Josh? Uh, how does the pep react if it gets a pack that already has a shim on it? So how does the pep react if, the, if it gets a pack with, that already has a shim on it? Um, it drops it. <laughs> right, so... So the abstract of this talk mentioned IPv6 and adding it in there. The, um, our original implementation um, used IPv6 and um, in there we embedded it, the, a lot of the information was embedded into the IP packet. Uh, sorry, sorry, into the IP address. So like the user and host identity was actually in the IP address and we had the, the um, organizational stuff in there also. So that's because that was what was available for public release at the time. Um, and then this came up afterwards, and this is more recent, so I decided to give you guys this, this information, which is a bit more recent. It, the, stu the same stuff in this applies to the V6 implementation. The current V6 implementation does not require a shim. Make sure there's no questions over there. <laughs> there's none over here. Well, actually, you go. I'll come back. <laughs> so, yes. Um, ideally, the, um, like the hardware cert that I mentioned earlier would come for something like a TPM. It's not a requirement, um, but ideally, uh, it would. Can you repeat that? For the communication between the infrastructure components right. So the question was basically what are we leveraging for communication between me, the infrastructure components. Um, right now it's all proprietary. Any other questions? Yep. How do you distribute the hardware certificate onto the machine? Is that over the network or is that a uh, manual build process? That would be an, a manual enrollment pull, um, process. And the question was, um, how do we um, get the hardware certificate basically onto the system? Anything else? Yep. Um, Dick is watching the uh, Solution Talk asks if you can implement this with Active Directory. So the question is whether or not we can implement this with Active Directory. Um, yes, you could. Yeah.
process in the period at least is supposed to be over the line and can be very much similar sort of focusing on the set tunnels. Right. So theoretically it can be <clears throat> it can be implemented with Active Directory. Anything else? The next step is sort of to get a bigger scale test. <laughs> mm -hmm. Is the code going to be available, or is that not going to be released? That's it's currently still proprietary, unfortunately. Sort of hate to say that, but. When, when you had the, uh, the penetration testing going against the system, mm -hmm. Uh, they did not try that. That was not within the rules of engagement for that round of testing. Did they have any a priori knowledge of the protocol you had implemented? So the question was whether or not they had any prior knowledge of the protocol we had implemented, and yes, they did. They were fully, they asked, we, they asked anything we told them. But it wasn't in scope for them to it? At the time, it was not in scope for them to. At the, yeah, at a time, it was not in scope for the penetration test, testing team to attack it. So the question was whether or not we've looked into doing adding on sort of any input and end, endpoint integrity checking and um, no we have not not for this because this is just sort of one piece right, it's an initial. It's an, yeah and so you can theoretically should be able to work with just about anything else you want to use so it is and I can't say <laughs> So the, the question was whether or not this was a government funded, uh, whether or not this was gonna, government funded, and if so, which agency? Anything else? I don't even know what that is. <laughs> so the question is whether or not we've tested it or know if it operates with a DISA CIPRANET hard token. Uh, and yeah, no idea. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you.